Hi there! I'm Ari Lynette, and welcome to this week's episode of I Should Really Just Get Therapy. Today I'll be trying my best to explain the backstories behind some of the threads I post on Twitter. So before I get into the episode proper, I have to address that, yes, last week I did take a break from the podcast. And literally the only reason is that I needed to take some time out to recharge. I'm honestly pretty proud of having done seven weeks straight of podcasting, which sounds weird because it's just seven weeks. But I've been doing these episodes since September, and I'm planning to finish the first season in mid-December, then hopefully start the second season. Can't believe I'm even saying that, (laughs) but I'd like to start the second season sometime in January. And I already know what the first episode of this second season is going to be, but I'm waiting until 2021 to do it because it's like a specific topic where I'll need to wait until after the end of the year. But everything in between now and then is really a mystery until I actually reach that week. And this week, well, not this week, but last week, what was in my heart was a brick, as weird as that sounds. But this week, this actual week, which I'm getting right this time, I wanted to cover a couple of different topics that I've briefly talked about on my Twitter and actually elaborate on those topics a bit more. Because it's quite hard to do a proper discussion on a topic when you have a character limit. So basically, I have a Twitter account, which is at Ari Network, because at Ari was taken, probably by me many moons ago, <laughs> and I can't find the password for it. But that's where I talk about stuff, retweet stuff, and from time to time plug my content. I'd post links to my YouTube videos every time I had a new upload, I'd occasionally promote my palette designs, and I've even promoted this podcast on there. Once. I I really used to be a self-promo machine on Twitter, but now I am slipping in my old age. Probably because I've come to the conclusion that I don't really feel the need to anymore. And also, I do it more on Instagram now, where more people are actually going to see it. But that's not all I do on my Twitter. Oh no, you would be remiss to think that all I did was self-promo and retweet stuff. Sometimes, I talk about the most random of topics. Often ones that have nothing to do with makeup or the beauty community. And these topics aren't big enough to be a podcast episode on their own. But they're also not small enough to be these trivial, forgettable points. And sometimes they happen to live in my head for longer than I intend. So I promise this isn't just some kind of self-promo episode that I'm doing so that more people can go over to my Twitter, which, not gonna lie, that's absolutely one of the reasons. (laughs) I'm gonna be honest. (laughs) But I also want to use this podcast to talk about those weird little things that pop up. And it's not always going to be something that takes up a whole episode, so... This is going to be like a compilation episode of all sorts of different topics that have come from my Twitter. So this is going to be a lot of fun to do. And by a lot of fun to do, I mean this is going to be more of a laid back episode. Last episode I posted my grand manifesto about my issues with the small beauty community on YouTube. And then the episode before I decided to expose my former online life in the Monster High fandom. (laughs) And both of those topics have a lot of heavy personal investment for me, like over time. So this week's episode is going to be more of a fun and casual episode. It's still going to be personal because obviously I wrote those tweets and I was passionate about those topics to a point of tweeting them. But this is more of a on the surface personal rather than this thing I need to get out. This is going to be light and fluffy. So, today we are reading some of my most significant Twitter rabbit holes, as I like to call them. No, not all of them, just the ones I think are funny or have interesting backstories or are just plain noteworthy. So when you go onto my Twitter feed, you'll get to see those funny tweets and those little observations that I post. But what's special about this episode is that you'll get the law. And that's the juicy stuff that kind of explains why I tweet the stuff that I do. Often on this podcast, I like to include an origin story for each topic I talk about. And indeed, most of my tweets have origin stories, so that's going to be fun. If you like origin stories, well, good news, you're getting multiple in this episode. (laughs) I, I also appreciate that certain topics might be a bit niche to some people, especially if it's like a specifically British topic or reference, so... I'll try my best, (laughs) title pun, to give you the context on those. Either way, we're going to go into some tweets and the various reasons why I thought it was necessary to put them on the internet. Enjoy!
we're going to start with my most recent big Twitter thread as the time of recording. Who knows what I'm going to post next. But as of me writing my notes, my latest tweets are about Quibi. If you don't know what Quibi is, it was, we can say now, it was a paid streaming service that revolves around the concept of quick bites, hence the name. So all the content on there is around 10 minutes long and is designed to be watched exclusively on your phone. And there's no desktop version, so you have to use your phone to watch the content. But you can watch it in either portrait or landscape orientation for convenient entertainment on the go, as they probably have called it. Now, if you're listening to this, wondering who would subscribe to that kind of service, well, you're clearly not the only one, because recently it was announced that Quibi would be closing a mere six months after its launch. And I had thoughts on this. Now, I should clarify that Quibi didn't really properly launch in the UK, so really, I didn't really have a horse in this race, but I still had thoughts because I was following it for a while and I thought it was funny, to be honest. So I tweeted the following on October 22nd, 2020. It's a lot of twos. (laughs) Rest in peace, Quibi, the streaming equivalent of flushing a suitcase of money down the toilet. You promised short-form content, and you delivered. You only lasted six months. Looks like we finally found out how long a Quibi is. Godspeed, you beautiful bastard. (laughs) Don't ask me how, why I ended it like that, but I did. (laughs) Now, context. One of the big points of criticism around Quibi, other than the fact that it's functionally useless in a world where YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok are successfully dominating the market of short form content for free, is that the amount of capital that went into Quibi is extortionate. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not just saying, oh, this is a waste of money in that old boomery way of thinking investment into the arts is pointless. Because I love the arts. I think the arts are friggin' awesome. And I'll always advocate for more funding for the arts, more arts in general. The arts are great. We love the arts on this podcast. But the thing is, (laughs) Quibi raised over $1 billion in funding from a whole host of investors, a lot of big names. Then it took this colossal nosedive because almost nobody was willing to subscribe to it beyond the free trial. And, oh my goodness, even after raising an additional $750 million, it ended up dissolving after six months. (laughs) If that's not flushing a suitcase of money down the toilet, I don't know if I could tell you what is. I mean, people rag on Netflix for its extortionate debts from commissioning a ton of content, but at least Netflix gets hit sometimes. So Quibi had this massive ad campaign across the United States, which I'd heard from a lot of people, and roped in as many celebrities as they could to create content and be part of the launch. And even then it wasn't enough because of the fundamental flaws of the service, both in concept and in practice. You couldn't take screenshots, so you couldn't meme anything. You couldn't watch the stuff on a TV, or at least at first, because they were so gosh darn insistent on making it mobile only so you could watch on the go. And that's a problem because, one, if people want to watch short bursts of content on the go, they don't need to have it be filmed professionally and have celebrities in it. Chances are they're already pretty satisfied with their Instagram content, TikToks, YouTube videos, etc., which are all of good quality, mostly. And two, because nobody's fucking going anywhere because we're in a global pandemic. And I will admit, COVID and the timing was probably a big reason why Quibi eventually failed, but I'll be honest, you'd be a clown to think that that was the only reason. Quibi was conceptually just not a thing anyone was looking for, and to launch in an incredibly saturated market of streaming services, especially new streaming services, because 2020 is just bombarding us with new streaming services all the time, with all of its shortcomings that Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus don't have, it was kind of inevitable that it was going to fail. Also, this, they had this ad campaign where they acted like a Quibi was a measurement of time. So that's why I put that little quote in parentheses. A Quibi apparently lasts six months. Good to know. Th- there is also this uh, schadenfreude I have when it comes to the downfall of Quibi because of the people at the top of it. But as I was looking at more and more tweets around the subject, I realised that to the crew members, and particularly the people working on the smaller productions, my tweet could have come across as a bit too biting. People will have lost their jobs over this. So the same day, I tweeted a follow-up, clarifying my thoughts. 
That being said, I hope the people who worked on its content go on to better things and I wish them all the good luck in the world. And that's something I really mean. Like, it is funny to laugh at such a disaster as Quibi with its celebrity driven marketing and its intrinsic flaws as a service. But it's important to remember that there are people in there who aren't necessarily responsible for these flaws. Creatives who got their shows commissioned by Quibi and are now under uncertain circumstances, even with second season renewals. There hasn't been any real clarification of what will happen to these shows, though I've heard apparently the creators can shop the shows to other platforms or networks. Don't, don't take that as gospel, though I'm still not 100% sure on the situation. Either way, I want these creators to be able to keep on creating, because as I said, I do love the arts. And hopefully they'll get projects commissioned by more reliable platforms and be able to have their content seen by millions and be successful. So. My real schadenfreude is directed towards the people at the top. And this is best illustrated by my next part of my follow-up tweet. That being said, I can't help but laugh at Jeffrey Katzenberg, petty assholes, multi-million dollar full project, flop like a lethargic haddock. Also, I used the phrase that being said twice in the same tweet. Feel free to judge me. I judged me heavily. But the real point of this tweet, aside from pointing out the lack of variation in my vocabulary, is that I like seeing rich people fail. <laughs> I don't know if you feel the same way, but I'm a sucker for seeing the 1% fuck up. It's a guilty pleasure of mine. And I don't know if Jeffrey Katzenberg is in the 1%, but I'm engaged enough within the world of animation to know a thing or two about this guy. I won't get into the complex story of his role in the Walt Disney Company, because that's a whole other episode, and I would love to do an episode on, like, Disney's failures. <laughs> because I think that's just a really funny topic. However, shit went down, he resigned from the company, and then he helped found DreamWorks. So I should also clarify, the nickname Jeffrey Katzenberg Petty Asshole is a reference to a Lindsay Ellis video about Robin Williams and celebrity voice acting. So I'll sum up the story quickly. Basically, Robin Williams was cast in both Aladdin and Fern Gully, two animated films from different studios. And Katzenberg must have been pretty annoyed that Robin didn't drop out of Fern Gully, that he attempted to sabotage the production of Fern Gully by buying out as much studio space as possible to essentially stop them from doing the stuff they needed to do. And then post Disney, there was a big feud between DreamWorks and Pixar because allegedly, we're going to say allegedly for this, Katzenberg stole Pixar's idea for a bug-themed film and tried his darndest to have DreamWorks release Ants before Pixar could release A Bug's Life, hence the nickname Petty Asshole. So, of course I'm going to laugh at his big project sinking. Not just because of like, personal bias, I honestly have nothing really against the guy, despite having said that whole paragraph, but when you have something that's managed by top executives, ridiculously expensive, cram-packed with celebrity endorsements and promotion, and it flops? That's hilarious! Quibi is the ultimate example of hubris. It's celebrity hubris, it's executive hubris, it's marketing hubris, just hubris as a whole. That I can laugh at, but I hope that the people who worked on their shows can still go on to more projects. I hope that the people who are promised series renewals will still get those second seasons in some form. For example, Sasha Velour's series, Nightgowns, was the one thing about Quibi I was unironically pretty happy about and actually quite excited about. And that got renewed for a second season not too long ago. I hope that can still happen, whether that's on another platform or in some other form. I still hope for that. And I hope that there's still some way that I can watch that Anna Kendrick dummy series because it sounds like a lot of fun. And I like Anna Kendrick. She seems like a great person. All that being said, <laughs> The downfall of Quibi was an entertaining one, and I hope the companies learn from it. Though sometimes I think companies don't learn from stuff and they just operate on the basis of their own self-belief. <laughs> like, if you can dream it, you can do it. And then they'll just fuck up everything along the way and throw money at each and every problem. I can laugh at that, because if I didn't laugh at rich people being irresponsible with their investments, I probably wouldn't stop crying about it. It can be difficult for people nowadays, especially as we're in a global pandemic, so sometimes it can be fun to watch rich people mess things up. As long as we're respectful of the people who weren't messing things up and just wanted to create content, I think there's room for both of those things. Now we've roasted Quibi, it's now time to talk about another company co-created by Jeffrey Katzenberg and DreamWorks Animation! 
the company that's left its mark on the animated film industry with classics such as Shrek, Kung Fu Panda, How to Train Your Dragon, and uh, other films like Turbo, Charles Voltaire, and The Boss Baby. Sometimes they have successful franchises with insightful themes and genuinely funny moments, and other times they just throw celebrities into voice roles and fire up the pop culture reference machine. It's a studio with a very diverse output, let's call it that. And in 2013, one of the films they released was The Croods. Fun fact, I saw this film in Florida when I was on holiday in Orlando. It was at the Regal near International Drive, and it was a lot of fun. I thought it was a great film. So, over the past few years, a sequel to this film has been in development and been scheduled and rescheduled over time. In fact, at one point it was cancelled in 2016, then uncancelled in 2017. And now, as we look to November 2020, The Croods 2, or The Croods A New Age, is finally getting released. This film sees the return of characters from the first film, played by Nicolas Cage, Ryan Reynolds and Emma Stone, meeting a brand new family called the Bettermans. Peter Dinklage plays the father, Leslie Mann plays the mother, and Kelly Marie Tran plays their daughter, Dawn. In late September, we got the first promotional material for the film. The second thing, I'm going to do this list out of order, but the second thing was the trailer, which was great, no complaints there. In fact, that trailer made me ship eat with Dawn. <laughs> like, I swear my involvement in animated media over the years has just devolved into shipping and praying for a crumb of LGBT representation. So I don't think anything's going to happen there. That's just a fun ship. But the first thing, what we got before the trailer, was the teaser poster. So a teaser poster is the first poster that gets released for a film, one that's based more around subtle imagery and symbols. Usually these get released around six to eight months before a film's theatrical release, but for The Croods 2, I'm just going to call it The Croods 2, this turned up only two months before release, which is pretty unusual for films in general. The poster is very simple and shows a white background with a group of character renders, the film's logo, and a tagline in impact font. Impact font. A massive animation studio owned by colossal conglomerate Comcast is putting out film posters featuring impact font. Impact font. I am deeply and utterly offended by the fact that one of the biggest mainstream animation studios is making posters with one of the default fonts you get on Microsoft Word. Okay, I'm, I'm mostly exaggerating, but it's a bit weird, isn't it? In fact, to me, it was so weird that I just had to tweet about it. Ari's log, September 20th, 2020. Tweet 1, quote tweeting the post from the original DreamWorks account. Why did they use Impact Font for this? Tweet 2, follow up. Crudes 1 had a $135 million budget. Now DreamWorks can't even afford to license a decent font to put on their poster. Now you're probably thinking, Ari, this is a rather pedantic subject to make a Twitter thread about. In fact, there are probably much better and worthwhile topics that you could put your endless stores of energy towards that don't involve font choices for animated movie posters. So why are you not covering one of those points? Well, my good friend and or follower, I don't know why either. But that's what my Twitter is for, my lovely listeners. My social media presence is divided pretty logically. My YouTube is for well-edited content related to the beauty sphere. My Instagram is for my palette designs, redesigns, beauty crawl streams, and of course, my face. My podcast is where I put my long-form discussions and or rambling. My Reddit is where I, at times, post the hot takes that I don't post anywhere else in fear of being cancelled. And my Twitter is the dance floor for random irrelevant shite. And this Crudes 2 Impact Font Frustration Festival is the exact kind of random irrelevant shite that my Twitter is renowned for. But come on! I've had a thing for fonts for a very long time, and I can spot a Microsoft Word font from a good country mile. And Impact is like the Tom Cruise of Microsoft Word fonts. You can spot the stunts in the Scientology from a mile off. So when I saw the Croods 2 poster with Impact font, I was flawed. <laughs> in fact, fun fact, I saw this exact poster two days before retweeting, and I thought I dreamed it. <laughs> I thought I'd, I'd made it up. I'm not lying when I say this poster made me question my lucidity. Like, how? Who signed off on this? 
impact is like a meme fund, like the top text, bottom text memes. And, and this is a multi-million dollar animated film going into cinemas, well, the ones that are left, using that font on their friggin' poster! <laughs> Did you fire all of your marketing team? Were they not able to access any other fonts while working remotely? Because I have a computer, and I'm more than familiar with the holy art of font shopping. Get a font license. It's not hard. You are owned by Comcast, who has a thousand times more money than all the people who have ever listened to this podcast put together. Why is this happening? <laughs> Why did my blessed little corneas have to see a mainstream movie poster with impact font on it in the year 2020? Oh, wait, that explains it. 2020 is just the year where everything goes to shit, and apparently that includes movie posters. But the thing is, this doesn't include all movie posters, even ones for animated movies. Because recently, the first poster for an upcoming Disney movie has just come out, and it's amazing. It's for Raya and the Last Dragon, which coincidentally also stars Kelly Marie Tran, this time as the title character Raya, or Raya, depending on how you pronounce it. Before I go into the poster, I just want to say how happy I am that Kelly Marie Tran is just prospering with her career. She's been through so much shit from a bunch of racists and sexists and overall just trash horrible people online just for existing. And honestly, I'm always wishing the best for her and hoping she succeeds. This is a Kelly Marie Tran stan account. <laughs> but uh, she's starring in Riot and the Last Dragon, which has just released both their first trailer and the teaser poster. And it's beautiful. It's this highly detailed close-up of Raya resting on her sword as the rain comes down, her hat's covering her eyes, and you can just focus on all these little details, like the gem on the sword and the texture on the hat, and the rain, oh my goodness, CGI rain has come a long way. And you can tell, because it looks gorgeous here. <laughs> this whole poster is an example of how to do a teaser poster right. You can see all of the intricate details, but it's presented in a subtle way that blends with the atmosphere. It's a little intense, but it's badass. Like, I love this poster. And the thing is, that shows that animated posters can still be good. So I don't know what DreamWorks is on to put out a teaser poster with tiny character renders on a white background. Y you can't appreciate any of the details on the characters because it's a far out group shot. All of this just below a giant black tagline in impact font. <laughs> it's just like, why did you do this? Okay, so I'm gonna stop talking about this because otherwise I'll probably be here forever. In summary, poster artists at Disney, keep up the good work. Poster artists at DreamWorks, um, I don't know what to say because I never want to be rude to anyone in the animation industry. If you didn't know, I recently graduated from university having done a course in animation, so I know it's freaking hard. That being said, please don't make the same mistake again because it's a bit embarrassing. That's what I'm going to say on that. So. If you've listened to the very first episode of this podcast, you'll know I'm a bit of an obsessive for the 2019 Cats movie. And if you thought that a whole 40 minute podcast about it was all the Cats related content I'd ever make, you're sorely mistaken. Because I tweet about Cats too. If that episode was an album, these tweets are the Japanese bonus tracks. Or would they be the B-sides? I don't know. But either way, I tweet about Cats. One big thing is that I will take any opportunity to propose more movies in the style of Cats. If there's any intellectual property that involves anthropomorphic animals, I will suggest a cat style adaptation. That's just the way it goes. So let's start with my first proposition, which I talked about on April 7th, 2020. Pitch. Animal Crossing movie, but in the style of Cats 2019. <laughs> now, I for one think there probably shouldn't be an Animal Crossing movie that even teeters in the direction of live action, but I say things as jokes sometimes, and this was one of those times. But just imagine taking Tom Nook, Isabel, Kikis, Lida, Blathers, and all your favourite villagers, and some of the ugly ones too, and give them the old digital fair technology treatment. <laughs> imagine, like, a completely white man, like a marshmallow white man, with dog ears and a ukulele. It would scar many a childhood, but it would be also pretty dope. That kind of thing would be straightforward enough for cats or dogs, like, those are the easy ones. But what about the owls? What about the elephants? What about the anteaters? What kind of uncanny valley CGI horror would take place to make that happen in live action? Yeah, that would be pretty horrific if I do say so myself. And I don't even think I realised that when I tweeted it. But, just to clarify, 
it would probably be just as bad an idea as the original Cats movie, if not worse. So please, Nintendo, if you were listening, please do not take that suggestion seriously. If there is any kind of Animal Crossing movie, it should absolutely be animated. End of story. And even then, I don't really think the world needs an Animal Crossing movie, at least now. What the world really needs is an Animal Crossing theme park. That would be amazing. And they could make it like an immersive experience. Like, come on, I take that over a movie any day. Then again, maybe that's just my hype over Super Nintendo World. But that's not the only time I suggested a cat style adaptation for a film. In fact, the prospect of a live action remake of Disney's Robin Hood had me putting forth a bold proposal, and that happened on April 10th, 2020. So I saw an article with the following headline Prepare yourselves, Disney fans. Robin Hood is getting a live action remake for Disney Plus. And I don't know what accent that was. And I quote tweeted that article with this. If it's not in the style of Cats 2019, then they can keep it. <laughs> to be fair, I actually kind of do mean this one. And that's not because I'm actively clamoring for more movies in the style of Cats. I think Cats is a one of a kind and probably ought to stay that way. But because I really don't like Disney's live action remakes, I think they're just so cash grabby and soulless. I'm already much more of a fan of animation in the first place because it's just such a great medium. But taking an animated classic and putting it in live action, surrounding it with CGI and celebrities, I, I just can't stand it. Therefore, the only way I will accept a remake of Disney's Robin Hood is if it's in the style of Cats. And it's a musical, also like Cats. They can even get Taylor Swift to write a song for it if they want to. Because in her words, if you can't get T.S. Eliot, just get T.S. Yeah, she actually said that. <laughs> But weirdly enough, <laughs> I think that the live-action Robin Hood could be sort of similar to Cats, only the technology won't look as weird and there won't be any ironic value. Which, the ironic value is what makes Cats for me. That's what makes it so much fun. That's why I talk about it so much, because it's got so much ironic value. A live-action Robin Hood would just be some soullessly competent CGI with celebrity voice roles and nowhere near as much magic as the animated version. Robin Hood probably wouldn't be attractive either. So unfortunately, I think either way, this adaptation won't be my favourite. But I'm biased because Disney live action remakes are not my cup of soup. And I'm at peace with that. Now, my last Cats related tweet I have is more of a self-reflective observation. I realised something big about myself on April 22nd, 2020. And I just had to let the world know. Just realised I am, in fact, Jenny Anydots the Gumby Cat. Lazy as fuck all day, but when the day's hustle and bustle is done, then the Gumby Cat's work has got hardly begun, and I stay up till half two in the morning tweeting shit like this. <laughs> so why did I tweet that at half two in the morning? Because I am settling with the fact that my sleeping pattern is completely fucked. I've been spending my mornings in bed and getting up after midday just because I don't want to be up and around people. I don't have the energy for the day's hustle and bustle even though it's just being in the house with other people. It's a lot easier for me to spend a short afternoon in the real world, which is far from healthy, but at least I can admit that. Then, around midnight, I have all the energy in the world to just put into everything. I'll get ideas for palette designs, do some drawings, watch some Subway Surfers story compilations, and then realise I should probably go to sleep. <laughs> And I quickly made the connection with the old Gumby cat, who seems pretty lazy and spends a lot of her runtime as the comic relief, but has actually done some pretty productive stuff at night. I know I don't love the weird mice children or the horribly animated cockroaches, but hey, chances are she'll have put a lot of work into getting them to be productive. So if you think about it, that little tweet has a lot of significance to it. See how you said you'll get all the backstories in this episode? Hint that rewarding. And that's not the only reward I have for you. My other reward is that I won't be talking about cats again this episode. Hallelujah. The next topic involves my sister, or more specifically, my sister's strange thoughts and beliefs. You'll see what I mean when I get into the backstories of these tweets, but sometimes she believes some odd stuff. And if I had a pound for every time she believed something odd and one of my tweets was involved, I would have two pounds, which is not very much but it's still enough of a correlation for me to talk about them both today. The first one is possibly one of the funniest things that's happened to me all year. And I mean, I've needed it because this has been a bit of a shit year. 
but this was just so funny and unbelievable that I just had to tweet about it. And the good thing is, I don't even have to really explain what it is because the tweet explains it for you. <laughs> and this ironically comes from the 4th of July, 2020. My sister thought that Hamilton was about a bear. My sister lasted through five years during the global phenomenon of Hamilton, thinking it was about a bear. And she's only just realized that it isn't about a bear. I wish I was joking. <laughs> yeah, in indeed, my sister did think that the globally successful Broadway musical Hamilton was about a bear. Not the Founding Fathers of America, but a bear. <laughs> So she explained to me that she thought that because she considered Hamilton to be a pretty suitable name for a bear in like the similar vein to Paddington Bear. And the weirdest thing about it is that honestly, I don't disagree. Hamilton does sound like the name of a cute bear. I was sympathetic to her belief, but not that sympathetic because I did tweet about it. Because it's even more strange when you put it against the timeline. Hamilton opened in Broadway in 2015, swept the Tonys in 2016, around that time I believe it hit the West End as well, and only in 2020 did my sister realise that there was no bear involved. So this was around the time that they released the film version on Disney+, Plus, and I've never seen Hamilton, but I have picked up enough bits and pieces of info to get a rough idea of what it's about. And I kind of assumed that my sister did too? That may be a bit presumptuous of me or oh, it might have been a bit presumptuous of me. That being said, the idea of a cast and crew staging a production of Hamilton halfway through, a bear just barrels on stage, and everyone has to just rule with it while accommodating the eight-foot grizzly that's about to fall into the orchestra. I don't know how big the bear is, I don't know bears. I guess it's the kind of thing that keeps your head above water during a global pandemic, because <laughs> it, it was definitely entertaining for me, and it definitely made my days brighter. But the other tweet I wanted to talk about is something that wasn't documenting one of my sister's weird thoughts and beliefs, but was the thing that actually set off one of them. October 9th, 2020. I present to you the only thing that can save 2020, bringing back golden balls. <laughs> so quick context, this is quite a, a British reference, so I'll just explain it. Golden Balls was a game show that aired on ITV from 2007 to 2009. I have quite a bit of nostalgia for it, and especially now where I find myself so bored with the current lineup of daytime game shows. I think it would be great if ITV did bring it back. It was a show where the contestants could lie and be manipulative, and it was kind of fun to see that, because, you know, that stuff is fun. Entertainment. <laughs> so I tweeted this earnestly, but I also tweeted it as a joke, like in jest, as you do with this thing's gonna save 2020 kind of stuff. So my sister came into my room a couple of days after and talked about something to me. She said how it was so exciting that they were bringing back Golden Balls. I had not heard any news about it. And one of the main reasons for this is because there hasn't been any news about it. <laughs> I tweeted what I tweeted as a lighthearted joke, not an actual announcement. I'm not the commissioning director at ITV, but I had to explain to her that it was a joke and this revival wasn't actually happening. I think she mentioned that she saw like a video related to Golden Balls and she probably just joined up the dots wrong. But either way, I thought it was funny. <laughs> so here's my parting statement for this section of the episode. My sister is actually quite smart. I want to stress that and make sure people know this is all in jest and she would absolutely do the same thing if she was on the other foot. But it is funny to see her sometimes think strange things and have those turn out a bit wrong. I'm assuming if you have close siblings, then you'll get what I'm saying. Or you might think this about other family members or friends. I'd like to think that in some way this is a universal experience and something fun that we can all relate to and can distract us from the impending doom of the world. Everyone has moments of innocent clownery and often it's fun to look back at them. So to finish off this episode I thought it would be fun to go over some bonus tweets. The first one is all about soda and particularly an American soda. This tweet from February 6th 2020 says it all. Hot take, Pip Extra is just as good as Dr. Pepper. But really, it literally is the same thing as Dr. Pepper. Whatever kind of industrial espionage happened to make Pip Extra will baffle me till I'm on my deathbed. Now, let me emphasize something. I do not stand many things, at least nowadays. I've realized over time that standing brands or people or products or media or content, it isn't really that healthy and it kind of is something that sets you up for disappointment. 
but one thing that has rarely ever let me down or disappointed me is Dr. Pepper. <laughs> so yes, I stand Dr. Pepper. And not all Dr. Pepper is created equally. There are different batches and variations depending on the country it's been made in. And I've kind of experienced a few of those. But there are also plenty of imitators. One of them is Pib Extra, a drink made by the Coca-Cola company. If you live in the UK, you might be a bit confused by that and think, wait a minute, doesn't Coke own Dr. Pepper? The answer to that is no, they're just the distributor of Dr. Pepper in Europe and South Korea. But in the US, Dr. Pepper is owned by its own company, Keurig Dr. Pepper, and Coca-Cola makes a rival drink called Pib Extra, which used to be called Mr. Pib, and also used to be called Pepo. You can see why they had that changed, because they got sued. Uh, when I was on, on holiday in Florida in 2013, I think it was the same holiday where I saw the Croods, I also tried Pib Extra for the first time. And I was amazed to find that it tasted pretty much identical to Dr. Pepper. Like, I've had it a few times after that, even recently, and I still can't tell the difference. So I feel like there's some kind of sorcery involved there. Or industrial espionage, I don't know. Allegedly. I don't want to get sued. I don't work for either company. I I'm just a little fish with a lot of ideas, swimming in a pond full of Dr. Pepper. Or Pip Extra. I don't know. I can't tell the difference. <laughs> So the next tweet isn't about American soda, but rather about American food and the mascots that represent them. Turn your mind back to the days of February 2020, where during the Super Bowl, or in my case, online after the Super Bowl, the world was introduced to a new advertising titan, a precocious child with a top hat, a monocle, and a peanut body. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about Baby Nut. <laughs> the mascot for Planters Peanuts and the latest incarnation of Mr. Peanut. And this little fella got a lot of backlash. People were saying that he was this marketing gimmick and they were trying to make him a meme. Like, they were piggybacking off... Piggybacking? What am I saying? Piggybacking off of Baby Yoda and Baby Groot and really trying too hard for it to work. And that is a fair criticism. Memes do tend to work best when they just grow organically. And generally, if you can tell that there's a push to make it a meme, it kind of stops being good and it starts feeling like pandering. And that's the response that Planters got with this campaign. However, on August 12th, 2020, so quite a while after the original February introduction, I had some opinions to spill. Baby Nut is adorable, y'all are just mean. <laughs> because cute is cute, no matter how cynical its upbringing might be. And Baby Nut, I think, is absolutely adorable. And there's something I love about just taking this universally hated character and being the one person that would take care of this supposed abomination, like an ugly son that only I could love. It's beautiful. <laughs> that being said, Baby Nut has absolutely no presence in the UK, and I'm almost certain Planters has very little presence here either. So I guess I will be the bearer of this title. Baby Nut's only UK fan. And I'm at peace with that. So for the final tweet of this episode, we're going to one of my most recent tweets, a tweet from October 25th, 2020, where I demonstrate my love for terrible puns and outdated meme-based humour. I'm Audi like the car. Broom, broom. <laughs> yeah, I, I really did tweet that, and there's two reasons for that. One reason is that I really like the pun, and I also think the phrase broom, broom is really funny, especially when you know, indicating driving. However, there is another reason. I'm not trying to just do a funny, because this is also a prime example of my infamous vague tweeting. You see, sometimes I get in my feelings, and I can't always say what I'm talking about, but I still want to talk about it, so I vague tweet about it. In this case, it was, oh, this is really going to reveal me, isn't it? It was about me tuning into a live stream for the start of it, but I didn't know there were going to be guests on this stream. And one of the guests was someone I didn't support anymore, so I was, you guessed it, Audi like the car. <laughs> I, I don't like specifically calling out this stuff for no good reason, but I was pretty annoyed since I'd been waiting for the stream to start and was actually quite excited for it. So I vague tweeted, is it unhealthy? Yes. Am I admitting that to you while still doing it? Yes. Could there be a better way to work through the frustration? Absolutely. <laughs> But that's just the way life happens to be. And just like life, everything has an ending.
For example, you have now reached the ending of this episode. <laughs> so, if you like the episode, feel free to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss one of these lovely episodes. You can leave a review depending on the platform, or if not, you always have the option of sharing the podcast to whichever social medias you feel like. Or if you feel like checking out my social medias, you can find my YouTube, my Instagram, and of course, the very subject of this episode, my Twitter, all in the description. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. But before you go, remember, follow my Twitter. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm not kidding. But also remember, life is hard, but all you can do is try your best. See you next time, but not with your eyes, because this is a podcast. Bye for now. Thank <music> you.